Okay. I am ready. My name is William, or also known Bill Harvey. I was born in the Czech Republic in 1924. I want to give you some history and some geography where I come from. This part of the Czech Republic was situated below the Carpathian Mountains. Before 1918, this area also was known as Austrak Hungarian Monarchy. After 1918, Russia took it over and they didn't behave themselves too well, so the people chased them out. In 1919, became the Czech Republic under the president of Garrick Tamás Masaryk. The Czech Republic definitely was considered real democracy. They were very advanced in technology and they shared that with the whole Europe. 1930, the Czech Republic and Slovakia united and that's why they call them Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> I come from a family of six. I had four sisters and a brother. My city was called Berehova, was situated below the Carpathian Mountains. It was well known, my city was well known as here Napa Valley. We were growing grapes and making wine, that was the main industry. My father was in the First World War. He was prisoned in Russia for six years. When he came back, he endured awful lot of abuse and <clears throat> beatings. He was a very sick man and he was most of the time in a hospital in different cities. So I grew up, I barely knew my father because he wasn't in my city. My mother became the sole supporter of the family. She was the dressmaker but what I know about her talent, she was more like a dress designer. She made her own pattern. She worked very hard. She was determined to educate six children and also make a living for them under extremely primitive circumstances. When I say primitive, we had a home. There was no electricity. There was no indoor plumbing. My mother and transportation was your feet. There was horse and buggy days those days. So my mother had to go to the farmer's market every day to purchase the food, then to prepare it for six children and to also make a living. I always seen her sitting by the sewing machine, never complaining. Never even took time to go to bed. I assumed that she didn't have the time. For to sleep on a sewing machine, then I heard the machine going again. So I was about six, six, seven years old at the time. I never worried about myself. Thank God that I was born with the wisdom to know how much my mother loved us, but she didn't have the time to spend with the children. She had to work hard. I always had the understanding. I never worried about myself. I just worried, how could I ease my mother's pain to help her? Well, I was a very meticulous child. I liked to look clean. So I decided to wash my own clothes, iron my own clothes. Age of 10, I decided to go and work in a vineyard. The vineyard was situated up approximately a half a mile from my house. I could walk there. In the springtime, as we worked to work in a vineyard to cultivate the growth of the grapes. In the fall, we used to harvest the grapes. I remember it real well. I was only six, ten years old at the time. And <clears throat> 
In the harvest time, they put a backpack on me that of extremely heavy wood in order to carry the grapes from the mountain was growing in a flat land to the winery. Well, it was so heavy that I collapsed. I was in pain, but I didn't dare to cry. I didn't want to lose my job. My colleagues was very kind and helpful, and they showed me how to carry the heavy wood back with the grapes to the winery. So I was so happy that I was able to earn some money to help my mother. Things begin to be very bad all the way in Europe. It was in the early 1930s that Hitler was coming to power. Naturally, the communication wasn't like it is today. I didn't even own a radio at the time, but somehow we managed to hear what was going on. My mother had a friend in Berlin and his 19 year old son escaped the prosecution, came through our city then he proceeded with his journey. He was telling us how they were killing the Jews. They were confiscating the Jewish property and they were burning the Jewish literature. So that's the way we managed to hear what was going on. So <clears throat> when I was a teenager, I heard Hitler speak on the radio to the world and he announced, I'm gonna kill every Jew in this world. If I don't succeed to kill every Jew in this world, I make it sure. The one who remains alive, not gonna be happy. Doesn't matter what part of the world they gonna live in, they gonna lose some member of their family. And the end he said, why? There is no why. Jews are guilty when they born. Well, you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, I was a teenager. Life was difficult as it was. Try to define and to make some sense of it why I was considered to be a second-hand citizen. I felt I was just as good as anybody else. Naturally, before the, before the second World War, the domineering power in Europe was not America, it was Great Britain and France. And we, we didn't take it seriously. We, we felt that they're going to stand up. They're not going to stay silent about it. But to our disappointment, they did stay silent and Hitler was able to pursue with his twisted ideology. Germany was in an extremely difficult economic situation. They were extremely advanced to create war machines, tanks and aeroplanes to kill people, but their land wasn't even fertile enough to grow potatoes. So Hitler decided he's gonna use the Jews as scapegoats. As I was growing up, I always was told that the German people is the most cultural, most, <clears throat> most uh, cultural people, and they, <clears throat> they had the most education. They were very industrial people. I had a difficult time to comprehend. Hitler wanted to create an aerial nation, everybody with blonde hair and blue eyes. What a hypocrite. He had the ugliest black hair with black mustache, a distorted face. And ladies and gentlemen, the whole world stood silent. They could have stopped them very easy. At that time, the prime, <laughs> the prime minister of Eng England was naval chamberlain. Instead of stopping Hitler, they could have stopped it very easy. He decided 1938 to go and negotiate with Hitler in Berlin. Out of the negotiation, they cut up Czechoslovakia. 
The part that I came from was given to Hungary. Part of Romania was given to Hungary. And the Sudeten part of Czechoslovakia was given to Germany. In 1939, we became under Hungarian occupation. By the way, the Hungarian government and the Hungarian people were very anti-Semitic and they are even today. Soon as they came to town, they immediately made us feel secondhand citizens. In 1941, the Hungarian government decided only 6% of the Jewish children were able to pursue their education. The education runs a little bit different in Europe than here in the United States. When you finish the sixth grade of elementary school, you have choice to go to high school, which was four years. If you were capable to pass an SAT test, I assume like an entry test, you were able to enter to gymnasium. And when you graduated from a gymnasium, age of 18, like you graduate here from high school, you had equivalent to two years of college credit because we had so many, we took so many more units than you take here in high school. I was fortunate enough to fall into the 6%. I graduated age of 18 from a gymnasium. Unfortunately, my graduation present became Birkenau Auschwitz. Birkenau was the exterminating camp consisted of all the gas chambers and the crematorium. Auschwitz was the concentration camp. In 1943, Russia and Germany was in war. Around December 1943, we became under German occupation. By the way, the Hungarian people and the Hungarian government were very very willing collaborators with the Germans. As soon as they came to town, they made us wear a yellow star written on a Jew. That's the only way we were allowed to walk out of the house. Not too long afterwards, they decided to establish a ghetto in a city. By the way, my city was called Berehova. The population was approximately 26,000, give and take. One third of them was Jewish, surrounded by a little farm town where less Jewish people was living. So first they decided to take the people from the little farm town. We had a red brick factory, which was manufacturing bricks to build buildings. When the brick came out of the oven, have to dry. So they had a long place with a roof found no side to it. That's where they would put the brick to dry. That's where they established the ghetto. So as I said, first they decided to collect the people from the little farm town. They went to their door without any notice, gave them five minutes to take any possession that they wanted to bring with them. You can imagine the people was very upset to leave their home where their parents worked for a lifetime. They brought them into that so-called ghetto, housed them where I described you before the brick would dry. It was this part of the world. The winter usually arrives around November. We got a tremendous snow. The snow remains till the following year of the spring. So it was freezing cold. The people bought very little, didn't have warm clothes with them. They had no blankets. They were confused. They were families together, young and old, babies, little children. We were still in a city. So we decided to go to door to door to collect warm clothes, warm blankets, and much food as we possibly can to try to make the people more comfortable. And all the people was born in 
on the Lou farm time. One day they came to my mother's house also without any notice, knocked on the door. My mother, myself, and my two sisters was home. My two other sisters emigrated Brussels, Belgium in 1933. Now I'm speaking about the year of 1943. Both of my sisters got married. They each had children. We corresponded with them. We exchanged pictures and letters, but we haven't seen them the past 10 years because Brussels, Belgium was on the German occupation and Jews was not allowed to travel in Europe. So as I said, my mother, myself, my two sisters, my aunts, my cousins and their children, they were all born into that so-called ghetto. We were there for six weeks under terrible sanitation condition and the harsh treatment that we got from the Germans and the Hungarians. Very little food to eat. They promised to take us to work. After suffering for six weeks there, a lot of people got desert. And one day the train arrived with all the cattle cars. The sliding door slammed open on a cattle car. They pushed in as many people to that pet cattle. A cattle car as possibly can that we were crushed like sardines. When the, when the car was filled, the sliding door slammed close on us. There was no windows, only the wooden cracks of the car where the light came through and the car began to move. I cannot tell you what a terrible journey that was. Lasted four or five days and nights. The sanitation condition, the children was crying. They had fever. There was no medication after suffering four or five days. The train stops. The sliding door slams open. We didn't know where we arrived. Where we first, the stain stopped and the sliding door slammed open. When we first glanced out, it looked like a twilight zone. Big chimneys going to the sky. Smoke was going all over. We didn't know where the smoke was coming from, but we find out soon enough. We arrived to Birkenau, Auschwitz. I'm speaking about the year of 1944, the spring of it, where hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews was brought in to the Auschwitz concentration, Birkenau Auschwitz concentration. Birkenau was the exterminating camp consisted of all the gas chambers and the crematoriums. Auschwitz was the concentration camp. Poland was on the German occupation three years prior to the Hungarian Jews. So some of the Polish prisoners were in the camp for three years. Some of them, they were two years there. They worked by the railroad station for the Germans. The SS was standing in front of us, hollering, schnell, schnell, men, hurry out of the cattle wagon. Who they pick to be alive, go to the right. Who was condemned to die. Older people, when I say older, 45, 50 years old, and young mothers who were holding their children in their arm, go to the left. When the German SS didn't look, the Polish prisoner who walked by the railroad station whispered to the young mother, give your children to their grandparents. We didn't know why, but they knew why. He wanted to save the young children's life. The young mother's life, they knew that they cannot save the children's life. Where some of the mothers were successful enough 
to give the children to the grandparent. But most of the children was bitterly crying, didn't want to be separated from the mother. So the young mother, with her children, go to the left, went to the gas chamber and a crematorium. Or the young people who was ordered to go to the right, they marched us into a big magazine, made us strip completely naked. They took every little possession that we still had with us, which was very little. They shaved our hair. They gave us a prisoner suit to wear. And in those days, many people had caught feelings and caught it in their mouth. They would yank it out of their mouth. As they marched us from Birkenau to Auschwitz concentration camp, we passed by the gas chamber. The gas chamber had little windows where the German would look in to see how far the people was dying from the gas. They used the gas very sparingly because they had a shortage. We were able to glance in and to see how our loved one was dying and we had no power to do anything. Anybody would look a certain way that they didn't like it, he would immediately be killed. They marched us into the Auschwitz concentration camp, which consisted of thousands and thousands of wooden barracks. Each barrack was approximately 1,000 square feet. They pushed into that 1,000. By the way, it was surrounded by barbed fire. Nobody could escape. Pushed in as many people they possibly can that didn't even who had room to lay down. Four o'clock in the morning, they would knock on the door and we have to come out, start to stand in roll call. I don't know what was the purpose of it because I said nobody could escape. Every morning when we came, came out of the barracks, front of the barracks, that people, they looked like skeleton, except of skin iron, was front of the building, piled up on each other so high that I have to look to see the end of it. And sometimes it took them three, four days before they picked them up. The reason was, as I said, that the mass killing went on. They were murdering between 12 and 13,000 people a day. So sometimes it took them three, four days before they were picked up. We got one today, a bowl of soup, they called it. It was about this big. No utensils. Five to six people have to share it. So we handed it mouth to mouth until that soup disappeared, which didn't fit for an animal. But if you didn't drink from it, you didn't survive. And if we were lucky that day, we got a piece of bread to eat. Being there the eight days, Next to us was thousands and thousands of wooden barrack. And empty, but suddenly filled up with families together, young and old, little children. Then I seen that I was a little bit envious that they were together and I witnessed what happened to my family and all the other loved ones. I happened to speak through the barbed wire to one of the gentlemen who I discovered was born in my city, moved up to the Sudeten part of Czechoslovakia, which was under German occupation. The city was called Lidica. The population was approximately 30,000. They killed one of their of German officers for that reason the whole city was born into the concentration camp. And the gentleman from my city told me, don't envy us because we all going to be killed. Well, we were there already eight days and we seen killing every minute of the day, but we couldn't comprehend how it's possible that they're gonna murder 
30,000 innocent children and adults. The next day we had curfew. We were locked into the barracks for two days, two nights. We heard the yawns, the moans, the cries. After two days, everything quieted down. And I witnessed how they murdered 30,000 people, innocent people. Last year, 75 years passed by, and they had January 27th, the liberation, Auschwitz liberation. They were celebrating. And I, all through those years, when I thought about those people, I wanted to convince myself that it wouldn't be possible that I witnessed how they murdered 30,000 people. I happened to watch change channels. I arrived to MSNBC and there was a gentleman who was eulogizing those people who perished the Auschwitz concentration camp. So I, I was convinced that it was no dream, it was reality. 44, as I said, hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews was brought into the camp. So we have to stand in line or that to be tattooed on the, our arm. We weren't called by our names. We, were, we had a number tattooed on the arm. There was a shortage with the tattooer because there were hundreds of thousands of Hungarian was coming in. So sometimes you have to stand in line for three, four days before they were able to put the tattoo on you. As I was standing in line, the SS came over and they needed people to work. I had a round face, they always picked me the first one. We came out of the line, the tattoo wasn't put on my arm. They packed us in the cattle car, they told us that they're going to take us to work. Well, we traveled again in the cattle car, it was cold, there was no food, I don't know how long. We are right high up in the Bavarian mountain to an other exterminating camp called Buchenwald. When we arrived there, you, you have to strip naked, shave your hair again, have to go through a disinfecting procedure. By the way, when we arrived there, the prisoners who were there already a couple of years told us, in below, when it gets below zero, and the people had to stand in roll call. They would take the water hold on the people and they sprinkled them until they froze to death. So when you arrived, as I said, you have to go through the disinfecting procedure, shave your hair. There was a big tub with full of harsh chemicals. Everybody had to rush down themselves into the tub on head to toe. When you came out of the tub, they put us in a cellar sitting on a cement floor. Our eyes, our skin was burning, we were in pain. And if they needed people to work, you survived. If they didn't need people to work, they wouldn't feed you for a day you would go to the gas chamber, to the grammatical. As I'm sitting on the floor, very unhappy, full of pain, somebody walks into the room and begin to question the people. Anybody knows anything what happened to my family. As he came close, closer and closer to me, I discovered my brother-in-law. I recognized him, I never met him in person but I seen him on picture. He was bought in from Brussels, not as a Jew. He had falsified Christian paper. 
he was born in as a resistant fighter, as a partisan, and Christians had better treatment. He was called Kapo there, meant four men. And day before, he's the only one who was able to come into the room, and day before he spoke to the transport who came in, and he was looking for somebody to give some information about my family. And so he came back the next day and he that's the way he find me there. I was there for six weeks before I had a chance to say goodbye to him. They needed people to work again and they picked me again. They put us again in the cattle cars and we went through Germany, we came to the city Leipzig, near Leipzig was a city called Lena, who had the biggest gathering refinery. The Allies planes used to come and bomb every night. We were taken there to clean up after the bombing. We were housed in a horse barn, sleeping on a cement floor. We were given a wooden pair of shoes, wooden sole, canvas stuff shoes, but we weren't allowed to wear the four miles except before we enter to the refinery. We have to put the shoes, shoe, tie the shoelaces, put the shoes on our shoulder, march bare feet on the unpaid road, which was full of stones. Many people's feet got infected and every day got worse and worse if they couldn't pick up the speed with the rest of us, they were constantly beaten until they died on the road. That lasted for two months. After two months, they decided we should, shouldn't waste the time to walk. There was a vacant lot. Processed it from the refinery. They put some tents there and they housed us in those tents. The Allies planes used to come every night, a bomb, and many times the Schaffner came through where we were housed, and many of us was dying, but we didn't mind that, we preferred that, because this way we felt that maybe, maybe one of us has a chance to survive and tell the world what was happening. That that lasted on the spring of 44 till about September 44. By that time, the refinery was so bummed out that they couldn't see that they can put it into working condition. By that time, many of us died from the shrapnel of the bomb, or if we couldn't leave the heavy iron after the bombing and the heavy stones, the SS was constantly back of you and beating you until you died. So the, by September, they decided to, the few people who left alive, they decided to take us to another place. We traveled again without food. It was raining and snowing. And we arrived high up in the Bavarian mountains to we were taking there to dig tunnels under the mountains, travel to the railroad station, unloading railroad tracks, bring it to the mountain. We were housed in a horse barn. After six weeks, a typhus epidemic broke out and half of the people perished. The other half was remained to work there. For September 1944 till middle of March 1945. This place where we worked was very close to Buchenwald. Buchenwald was liberated by the Americans around April 11, 1945. So it was very close. We were very close. So I happened to be in a railroad station unloading railroad tracks. I fall down 
and piece of iron fall on my right foot, broke three places. No medical attention. A few days later, they put us again in the cattle cars. The German was running for their own safety, the German SS, because they knew that the Americans go to liberate Buchenwald any day. They put us in a cattle car again. We traveled, I don't know how long, it was freezing cold, no food to eat. People was dying during the journey left and right. By the time we arrived to Buchenwald, I was frozen. They told I was dead. I was put among the dead people. And they came to transfer the dead people to the crematorium. The crematorium was worked by the, by the uh, prisoners. The German security was running for their own safety because they knew that um, the Americans were going to liberate any day. So, there was, so he discovered the, the prison, prisoner who worked by the crematorium discovered that I was just frozen, I wasn't dead. Five days later, I woke up in a barrack. I was age of 21. I weighed 72 pounds. I defrosted, it's amazing. And I was told the story how the prisoner saved my life and why he was able to do it. I was so happy to be alive. I was incarcerated about a, I'm including the ghetto time in the city and the concentration camp for about a year and a half. And suddenly I looked down. I witnessed the worst I ever seen the whole year and a half. About 20 to 21 person walks into the room completely naked. They didn't look like human beings. Pieces of, they look like skeletons you see in a museum, except some skin on. There was not one clear place on their skin. Pieces of flesh was missing all over. I was told they had traveled for six weeks with an open cattle wagon when it was snowing and raining. The people got berserked and bitten into each other's flesh. Can you imagine that? Yeah. I don't believe they ever were able to recuperate, but how they walked into their room beyond my comprehension. And days later, I asked the people there to carry me outside to get some air. They carried me outside. I couldn't stand up on my feet. And I hear a gentleman speak with a French accent. I recognize the voice. When I was there a year before and I met my brother-in-law, he also introduced me to this gentleman. I was so happy to hear his voice. The first thing I asked him if he knows where my brother-in-law is. He says he's here. He'd be so happy to know that you're alive. I reunited with my brother-in-law about three or four days before we were liberated. When he looked at me, he told me, he says, soon as you can gain strength enough to travel, I will not let you go back to Czechoslovakia. By that time, my city changed again, became under Russian occupation. She says, you go to come with the Brussels, Belgium. And that's what I did. I went to Brussels, Belgium. I find my sister during the war. She was had falsified Christian paper. Her two children was given to a Christian family and she paid for them every month, and they survived. And my younger sister escaped to Marseille, France, and she survived. I recuperated there for two months, and then I got a message from Germany. 
that my two sisters survived the concentration camp and they're going back where we came from. As I said, by that time it was Russia. By the way, my mother, my aunt, my cousins and their children, they all perished in a concentration camp. I told you I come from a family of six. I had four sisters and a brother. My brother, age of 18, died from malpractice from two doctors. My father, I was the youngest one, there was about eight to 10 years different. I was the youngest one. So <clears throat> three weeks before we went into the ghetto, my father was working with a cane, a very frail man. So the Germans and the Hungarians decided why should we take him anywhere? They beat him so badly. Three days later, he died. So he was buried in my city three weeks before we went into the ghetto. So as I said, as soon as I heard that my two sister, two sister is alive and they're going back to my city, so I immediately went to the Czechoslovakian Council. I had a hard time to convince him, but he did because Europe was completely bombed out. So many places didn't have the railroad tracks. I convinced him, he gave me the papers. It was a very difficult trip because many places I have to walk from one city to the other order to catch the train. I managed to get back. I find my two sisters. I also find three of my cousins. We stayed there for three days. Then we went up to Prague. Prague was under Russian occupation, but they said Prague going to be liberated any day. We stayed there for six weeks. We seen that the Russians are not going anywhere. We didn't want to stay under communism under no circumstances. They recommended to us if we go back to Germany and we stay in a displaced person's camp, we'd be able to emigrate to some other countries. So we went back to Germany. The part of Germany was called Niederbayern. The city was called Deikendor. They housed us previously before the war and it was a Hitler's youth camp. So it had very nice facilities. I begin to work for the UNRWA. The UNRWA was the beginning of the United Nation. So <clears throat> I worked in a magazine. We got all the food from America, the Red Cross packages. And I was responsible to divide the food among the people in the camp. Then the city was surrounded by all the time where all the displaced persons was living. They all came and got the food from me. So in, I was there from 1945 till the spring of 1946 when President Truman put a new amendment to the emigration law called the Truman Doctrine that all these place persons stayed such and such a time in Germany and was able to come to America without having to wait for a quota. It was called the Truman Doctrine. I was very happy to hear because my mother, my grandmother, my mother's two sister and a brother emigrated to the United States in the 1800s. My mother went to school in New York City and I have a picture of my mother, 1902, was taken in New York City. You want to see the picture? I'd be happy to show it. Yeah, that'd be great. Yes. You want to bring the picture for one minute, Malu, please? I lost my eyesight. I don't see. Oh. I have macro generation, but mm -hmm. I see you are a very beautiful young lady. <laughs> Thank That's you. Like I'm, I'm, sitting top of the television. Oh, you know, okay. That's why oh, okay. Between other Otherwise, I don't see. Mm. But I do everything else, so I don't complain. Oh, okay. I love it. The, the picture, you know, the, from the, the room there. 
just one second. Don't tell him that. I was just riveted. Yeah. Here is my mother who was taken. Oh, wow. I think 102. Wow. Just and my, gr grandma, my grandmother left America. So I don't, so she and my grandmother went back. But her two sisters and a brother remained in America. We used to correspond with them, exchange pictures and letters. And they used to help us financially a little bit. So I always wanted to come to America. The 31st of August, 1946, I arrived here with an army boat called Marina Perch. And I find one of my aunt. The other one was deceased, and my uncle was living in California. So, <clears throat> so I was, <clears throat> I had the language barrier. I didn't speak English, but I spoke five other languages. So my, I was by that time, age of 22, my aunt tried to figure out what kind of a job could I get where the people speak those foreign languages. I can learn from them English. Meantime, earn a living. I was very lucky that my aunt had a friend who had a friend in 719 Lexington Avenue. It was a cosmetology place that was the tea place of New York City. All the Radio City stars, the Rock City Theater, Metropa, everybody who was there in that place. And it was an international shop. They had about 28 to 35 operators working there. And they spoke those foreign. I could learn from them English, meantime earn a living. They took me in as an errand boy. As I said, I was age of 22. I was the youngest one there. I had some hair, so I was about <laughs> two inch tall. So, so I got the job as an errand boy to bring lunches to the people and all that. So I came to this country just to close what I had on with a broken heart and a broken soul. After the war, I had a breakdown. I was hospitalized for three months. I did all the crying and I decided I was too young to give up my life. And I was fortunate enough to have the wisdom to know that the first, my mother, I can do all the crying. I cannot bring my family back. I have to go forward with my life. First thing I have to learn to give up hatred definition of hatred is loss of love. Without love, you're not living, you're just existing, which is very difficult to do, but you can do it if you make up your mind. Then I also decided the best revenge is success in life. And I was determined to make success, particularly that I seen how hard my mother worked and and what a difficult life she had and so i decided i gonna make a success out of my life as i as i said sometime desperation gives you more inspiration to learn something in a hurry by end of the year i was able to work on some of those famous people. And I did like uh, Mary Martin that time, 1948. She was in a stage show called The South Pacific and many, many other stars. So <clears throat> by end of the year, I realized, you know, that I am going to make a success out of my life that I never went to cosmetology school. So, and you need a license to practice. So it came very handy. My boss's name was Madame Fisher. They called her the lady with the golden hand. 
and she did all the movie stars. Her husband's name was Alex Schlesinger, who was in the insurance business, but he handled the business end of it. He happened to have a nephew in the State Department, and his name was Arthur Schlesinger. I believe that he was head of the State Department at the time. That's the way I got my license. Please don't tell it to anybody. <laughs> After three and a half years, I made such a success. My name was in the paper all the time. And I saved up quite a bit of money. So in 1950, I decided to come to California to get acquainted with the only living brother of my mother who lived in the east side of the town called Volite. I arrived here the 3rd of March, 1950, I left a tremendous winter in New York. When I arrived to Los Angeles airport, I see the sun is shining and I took the bus to go to his house. I seen vegetation, I said to myself, I'm not going back to New York no more. I never did. Little that I knew that my license wasn't valid to practice in California. Just like an attorney, different state, they have the different license. Well, I wasn't worrying about to take my cosmetology test. By that time, my English, I was 13 and a half years, was good enough. But California State required, before you fill up your education for the cosmetology test, you have to prove you had high school education in the United States. In Mary, if you had college credit for Europe. My, my uncle was in the 70s, his wife was dying for, in, for cancer, so they didn't associate with any people. So I was here three days, what should I do? I was desperate, I didn't know single soul to meet some people. Well, I discovered that near his house was the Theodore Roosevelt High School. I went there and that was my lucky day. I met the teacher by the name Maria Kilbright, who was teaching the 12th graders. And he said to me, young man, I'm gonna do everything in my power. You go ahead and get, get your high school diploma and you go and get your cosmetology license. Or that for me to go to her class. By that time I was age of 26. I have to get, she had to get permission from the principal. She got the permission. I got went to her class for three months. I went to the adult night school at night. I bought all the vocabularies. I came here the 3rd of March, 1950. By September, I had my high school diploma had my cosmetology license, and I got a job, all due to this beautiful teacher by the name of Maria Kilbride. She was very, very kind to me. In her class, everybody had to memorize a poem, which was a very meaningful poem, and that was her favorite one. It was written by Ed, Ed, Edwin Markham, E-D-W-I-N, M-A-R-K-H-A-M, he was born 1852, and the poem goes like this. There is a destiny that makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. All that we put into the life of others, it comes back to our own. Everybody had to memorize it in her class. By the way, I became very successful in California. And when I was looking for her to help her, she was gone, I couldn't. So I got my <clears throat> license and September I got the job. I was on a job for two and a half years. 1953, I opened my own salon, 216 South, Robertson Boulevard in Beverly Hills called the Continental House of Beauty. And a few months later, I had the 
privilege to meet a native Californian young lady who was absolutely beautiful. And I show you the picture right now. She was 21 by that time I was 28. That's two of us. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes, beautiful, it? beautiful couple. It is my very wow. born. Yeah. Very fine, very intelligent. Three months later, we were married. Did I say 1953? I op yeah, opened my own salon. Mm -hmm. And just three months later, I was married. I was a fast operator. I say. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> We were married for 42 beautiful years. Unfortunately, 25 years ago, I lost her from cancer. I never got married because nobody could replace her. So I have two daughters. Both went to UCLA. One graduated in three years. And then she went to Southwestern Law School and she married an attorney. My younger daughter graduated from music. She majored in psychology. She got her degree. And then she wasn't happy with that. She went two and a half years to USC. And she became a CPA. She married a CPA. I have four grandsons. They are my most success in my life. I helped them with their education, two became attorneys, graduated from USC Law School. And during their school, they lived it practically in my house. They came early in the morning to study here. Grandpa made them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I told you, put food in your stomach, your brain works better. <laughs> so, and I have two younger one, my younger daughter there. One is 28 and one is 24. One graduated from Stanford. He majored in computer science, age of 23 with a master degree from Stanford. And he has a job with Microsoft. And my youngest grandson graduated also age of 23 with a master degree from Austin, Texas. He went there for uh, to 60 honor student class. She, he couldn't get into Stanford at the time, and he has a job with Apple. Wow. Those are my success story. They are, they practically call me every single day. The two attorneys, they're very bright. One is 32, one is 34. One works for a very big uh, entertainment law firm here. And the other one works for the father, also an attorney, and has an office. My son-in-law is retired, so he's managing the office in Seattle. So, so this is the most success in my life. I'm going to be 97 in May. They call me practically every single day. They still ask my advice. They love me not because I am their grandfather, they love me, but I stand for. As they say in America, never too late. I was aged 82, lost my eyesight age 78. My daughter was constantly bothering me. Why don't you go there and work for the Museum of Tolerant, which is located about, about uh, four or five blocks from my house, you can walk there. I told my daughter I, I would love to, but I don't feel that I have the educational background. I don't have a rich vocabulary. So one day I decided to go there, age of 82, and I applied for the job. And then before I started, I listened to all the other lecturer, the Holocaust survivor, and when I heard them, I decided that I can do it. I was born with common sense, you cannot get from box. box. Well, I've been there 15 years. It, 
I made such a tremendous success out of my lecture that I have over 1,200 letters from people, highly educated people, how I changed their life. I am teaching psychology without credentials, USC Law School, Loyola Law School, U U USC Law School. I teach in high schools. I lecture all very important places. People hear me. In four years ago, I made the Hollywood Reporter magazine the cover of it which is 11 Holocaust survivors who were, who were uh, associated with the movie industry. And, uh, <clears throat> and this month, as, as you know, the, the Oprah's bag, um, all the newspaper I'm written. I was invited to teach psychology for student who I took, I was invited about eight or nine years ago to the state of California by uh, the Speaker of the Assembly, Karen Bass, who is a congresswoman now. And, and I did a lecture there to the, uh, uh, to the Assembly. In, and so here I am, as I said, blind. I am going to be 97. I still enjoy life. Not easy to get up in the morning, pull yourself together. But I think about somebody who is less fortunate than I am, how I can help. That's the most rewarding part in my life. Don't you ever feel sorry for yourself. Always think about somebody who is less fortunate, how you can help. There is nothing greater feelings. There is nothing that I had have accomplished in my life. And I look back, I wish I would not have to go through that much, that much bad part in my life. But as I said, I had to, I had turned all the negatives into positives. You have you, there is certain things in life you cannot help. If you don't accept it and you feel sorry for yourself, you destroy your whole life. I look forward to get up every day and to help people. There is a young lady in a block in from my house who's 35 years old. She's been in a wheelchair with MS and blind. And I help her every which way financially. And Mr. Harry, when I hear your voice, you light up my whole day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, that doesn't come any better. That's the best part of your life to be here. All the earthly wealth that you accumulate, you can take it with you. You come to this world with nothing and you leave this world with nothing. But the impact and the good that you do for others, that when our model is the telephone or what? Well, it's okay, continue. Continue. Mm -hmm. Do you hear do you hear me? Yeah, I'm just waiting. <laughs> yeah, I saw you were getting a call. Big Van out. So thank you so much for listening to me. And I want to tell to your audience that they have far more in the they, they have to discover, get into themselves. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Life is beautiful, and all the beauty in life is free. When I get up in the morning and I have breakfast in my breakfast room, which faces the street, I have two trees, and the little bird, bird 
bluebirds come and sing there or flies, that's, that's the reward in life. So much beauty. Don't ever feel happy. Don't question a lot of things. There is no answer in life, you know. My greatest uh, lecture happened to, I was invited in a maximum prison in Lancaster, where 2,000 prisoners incarcerated for very as crime. It's a horrible place. Among them, 55 inmates prison for teenage crimes, age 15, 16, and 17. One of them was there 10 years, the other one 20, and, and the third one was there 30 years. They never had hope. And after my lecture, the prison, I, I pointed out to them that God gave you the greatest gift, your best, and the most important part of your body is your brain. Just think about it, what the brain does. He gave it to you that you should always think before you act, because once you act, you choose the wrong things, you can take it back, and then you have to pay the consequences. That's what you are. And now the prisoners, after being there, about four years ago it was, yeah. And uh, they sent me a, a, a letter in Christmas time and shows me how he's teaching this prisoner whose name was Darren. Been there 30 years, never had hope. And he tells me, shows me on a picture that he's teaching my teaching what I gave in the prison to the other prisoners and how he helps. Yeah. Mm. So, Carly, thank you so much and for your audience to listen to me. And I, I hope that all the people who have some problems, they, that they take the positive steps in their life and joy every day. I can tell it to you, life is still beautiful, I find it. And the only reason, because I'm helping somebody who's less fortunate. Mm. Thank you so much for it. You have any questions? Yes, I do. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it's just incredible. And I know it must be hard to, to tell that story. But again, I think it's important that we hear it. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely have a few questions. Some are from the audience. Um, the first one being, you know, how, why do you think humans are able to commit these types of, of crimes against each other? And what can we learn from, from what you've been through to, to not let that happen again? Well, it's extreme that you have to be very vigilant. Don't feel ever sorry for yourself and speak up loud. Speak up loud. And just joy every day when you, God, God gives you an extra day. And as I said, all the material things in life, which a lot of people kills for a penny, doesn't accomplish anything. That's not, doesn't bring happiness. Life is definitely what you make, you have to make it yourself. Unfortunate that we all have to go through a lot of humps and bumps and there is no question to it. And as I said, that a lot of people has a hard time to decide, like uh, Elie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor and, and a, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, he written the book, and his, his quotes in a book, and many times after my lecture, people ask me how, and the book, he's, she, she quotes that, where was God? And he's a very religious person, he was. I never doubted God. God created that human beings, not puppets. And people think if they go and pray, 
that sin's gonna be over. No. God created you <clears throat> human beings, and as I mentioned it before, gave you the brain. Think always before you act. And and as I said, just think about it, that I always tell my audience that we would be really puppets if, if God could control us. He was hoping that we use all the negatives for positive. And so you have to pay the consequences if you have this kind of a thinking. And as I said, speak out loud and be happy and make, and you have far more, God gave you far more, at, everybody has a special attribute they can contri contribute to, to a happy life if they thank, always use the brain and thank. Yeah. That's my oh. advice to them. I love that. I love that. It's so important. I mean, and would you, would you, I, I could certainly see you carrying that message over to the leaders in power all over the world right now. You know, we're, we're in some tenuous times at the moment. I said, oh, as I said, there is nothing that I didn't accomplish in my life, but I made up my mind to accomplish. I had a little inferiority complex because of my, that I didn't have education. But there is a lady who is a head of the museum. She's the director, her name is Liba Geft. She was educated in, in South Africa as a reporter. And she has the most, you know, that beautiful South African accent and, and has a very rich vocabulary, very rich. So each time we have premieres in a museum, I meet all the diplomats. By the way, I have pictures with all the movie stars and all. And I tell her, Leba, when you speak, I'm very jealous of your vocabulary. I says, this complex I have that I don't have it. He says, Bill Harvey, you don't have to have a vocabulary. You are smarter than all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is definitely something to be said about being able to think before you make a decision. And it seems that you've always had this, this greater self-awareness about yourself, and even in the midst of you know, freezing cold cow cars and, and terrible conditions and, and coming to America, you've always been able to right the ship. How do you do that? As I said, positive thinking, positive thinking. I have to have a strong perseverance. I somehow, I, I, I am so fortunate that I was born with the wisdom that I never felt. Age four, I am, age four, I can remember my, my mother and father had built this house and I was fascinated by how they made the bricks from uh, some kind of a earth and straw or something and they put it into a form. So I can remember it real well and was able to understand how my, I was the youngest one, you know, 10 years different and so my mother was all you know, she looked like an old lady, age of 42, when I was born. And that's nothing in America. A lot of people has their first child. But that time when you raise six children and she worked so hard as she did, she looked like an old lady. I always felt sorry for her. I had this, uh, I was born with this kind of a nature. I, I contributed to my mother, gift from my mother. I never worried about myself. I just worried about how can I help. And I was able to help her age of 10, age of 16. I was, I have to show another picture. Malu, would you be kind enough? The 16 year old, you know, from here I have it in a room. Yeah. I paid the mortgage. The, wow. the, here I was age of 16. Wow. Look at this. The material came from my uncle because they didn't have mass production in Europe. And my cousin was a designer and he made the suit for me. And wow. I looked 16 and I had to pay the mortgage in the house of my mother. 
So when I, re when I look back, I don't regret a day of my life because I always had the wisdom to know that how much my mother loved me because she worked so hard. She can take the cheapest meat because, you know, very seldom we had meat because very expensive and make cook for a, for a king. She, she had such ability, but mm. age of six, she was skilled and she looked, I believe that far older than I was, you know, age of 62, I'm 97, or a bit 97 in May. Yeah. Do you ever, just, do you ever just, speak to your mother um, in your day to day, just in your head? Do you ever reach out to her in thoughts? Yes, I have. I talk to her and see her pictures. It's in my dining room. You know, I have it. And, and, you know, I speak to her all the time and thank her for all the wisdom and all the good things that I inherited from her. Mm. You know? And what, what have you learned from your mother in your life that the mother listening to this right now should be teaching her child? the perseverance that she had. How did she do it? Not sleeping, fall to sleep on a sewing machine. Monday, she didn't know she gonna be able to Friday night. We usually have the nice and dinner and usually didn't even know that she gonna have the food. And by Friday night, she always had some surplus to help someone who didn't have nothing. That's the way she was. Mm -hmm. Never heard her complain. She was a very soft-spoken, very intelligent lady, very intelligent. Yeah. But she wasn't very smart when she went back from America. And my, mm -hmm. I heard my I love that here because she certainly would have had a much better life, you know. Mm -hmm. But not sometimes people make uh, uh, hasty decisions, you know, and uh, I, I believe the reason that she went back that those days in New York, they had the trolley cars and she was always sick on the car. Oh. Yeah. No, you're here I, now I, and you're, you're sharing this message with, with the entire world. What? And we're so grateful for that. I mean, we're so incredibly grateful. There is no place like the United States, no place, even that we had this problem yesterday, which is very sad, you know, that we had that, 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 that we just pressed each all over the world, the way, we, uh, the way we keep democracy here, which is true, there is no place like the United States or America with all the problem that we have, you know. Yeah. If there were one great message that you would want to leave with the audience before we close it out today, what would that be? Enjoy every single day that God gives you and don't ask questions. There is a lot of things. There is no answer. And be happy every day. And happiness is the way you perceive things in life. We all have to go through difficulties. We have to overcome it. And don't ever feel sorry for yourself and help someone who is less fortunate. That's the greatest, that's the greatest things that you can achieve in life when you help someone who's less fortunate. I guess there is nothing, as I said, financially. By the way, age of 56, I quit the beauty business. I said, I'm going to leave all the beautiful women instead of waiting until they leave me. Get old. <laughs> but, and I want to tell you that I regret sometimes that I didn't have the educational background and so forth, but there is nothing that I didn't accomplish in my life, but I made up my dialogue to, to accomplish it because I believed in myself and I never felt sorry for myself 
and I accomplished far more than I ever anticipated to accomplish. So I want to tell the people to enjoy every life. It's a gift from God to joy, but the only way you're going to enjoy it, if you think about someone or you can help, there is nothing greater than that. And to be recognized by your own family the way they do, I don't expect anything from them. I'm grateful that I'm here and I can still share my wisdom with them. And that's the greatest. Wow, it's such an honor. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with me and my audience. And we are forever, forever grateful. Thank you. And, and uh, when is it going to be aired, this uh, program? Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to fast track it for this coming Monday. Because I think, you know, especially with everything that's going on right now, I think this would be really what we all need to hear. And you are a beautiful lady. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That's a high compliment considering the company that you have kept. Um, but um, if you oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I will send you all the links. Um, if you if, or if your daughter would like to send any photos for me to include, please feel free. Or I can just source them online too. Um, but yeah, if you have anything you want to add, just just email me, let me know. You want me to send you some pictures with? If you, if only if you would me. like, otherwise I can just probably find some from like the Hollywood Reporter article and things like that. I have pictures when I lecture in a, oh, okay. the assembly for the young people when I'm in the, uh, what do they call it, in, in the hall, you know, where the uh, speaker usually holds an the assembly there, Karen Bess and all. I have over. 1200 letters. If you want me to send one or two letters, I'd be happy to send you, who's, you know, that, that I am, you know, the computer how I change their life. Oh, that'd be beautiful. Yeah, I'd love yeah, that. I, I'd love that. So keep in touch on this, but uh, I have many young pictures to send you with all the stars, everyone I want, you know. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Um, and it was a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you and as I, well. And I hope that uh, I did some good for the people. Let me know the response of the people. And if they have any question, I'd be very happy to you know, answer. I will. I will. Thank but you so much, Mr. Harvey. Take care. Oh, it's mine. It was a privilege to be with you and your audience. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye.